They're open 24-7, 365 days a year. America's go-to pit stops. Catering to our cravings. Quenching our thirst. But behind the coffee, sodas, snacks, and dogs, there's more going on than you think. These retail powerhouses take in one of every $23 spent each day in the U.S. They're built for speed. We like to keep the customers between like a two and a half minute, a three and a half minute transaction. They're designed to manipulate. There's a lot of opportunity to impulse guests into buying something that they weren't thinking about when they came in the front door. They're constantly on guard. You bounce your presence very subtly that says we're watching. And they're equipped to stop crime. Now, settle in with your favorite snack or beverage as we take you deep inside the convenience store on Modern Marvels. By 6 a.m. each weekday morning, at over 144,000 convenience stores across America, it's zero hour. Display cases are packed. Shelves stocked. Coffee dispensers filled. Time for the onslaught. The next three hours will be the busiest in the convenience store's day. And to maximize sales, they must have what the customer wants. I usually uh, coffee and bagel. That's usually what I get in, in the morning to wake me up. When I come here each time, I usually buy coffee. Convenience stores always cough. During the morning rush, convenience stores coast to coast sell over 11 million cups of coffee. And with it, millions of donuts, bagels, muffins, and breakfast biscuits. Americans spend one out of every $23 in convenience stores each day. That adds up to $1.7 billion every 24 hours. And the main reason is because convenience stores are fast. The average visit takes three and a half minutes. Have a great day, guys. Compared with 41 minutes at a typical grocery store, selling the same types of products. By 7 a.m. at the 7-Eleven in East Patchogue on New York's Long Island, the morning rush is in full swing. The store is one of the busiest in the 7-Eleven chain. But customers here aren't only buying breakfast, they're buying time. We like to keep the customers between like a two and a half minute and three and a half minute transaction from the time they walk in to the time they leave. Everybody's very fast here. As soon as you get to the counter, they ring you up and you're out of here. No matter what it is, you're always out, in and out, so. We take speed for granted at convenience stores. But there's a science to moving customers in and out in three and a half minutes or less. And if anyone knows how to do it, it's architect Joseph Bona. He's been designing convenience stores for over 30 years and always begins at the same place. Uh, the successful development of any store starts with the layout. Regardless of a convenience store's size, the layout divides the space into three zones, and each has a specific purpose. The first is at the store's entrance, which Bona calls the decompression zone. This is the area where people need to just take a second, get their bearings from the outside to the inside, and be able to see everything. While it might not seem important, the first moments in the decompression zone can make or break the convenience store shopping experience. People buy with their eyes, and they eat with their eyes. Having the layout uh, be presented in a way where it's easy for them to find things uh, is really, really critical. From the decompression zone, customers enter the next and most highly designed part of the store, the impulse zone. In this area are the things that every consumer that comes in that front door is going to be exposed to on the way in and on the way out. Things like coffee, like bakery, like sandwiches. We want those really up front. We want that to be in the main flow. We want people to see that all the time. In convenience stores, the self-serve coffee island is a high traffic area engineered for speed. The East Patchogue 7-Eleven is no exception. The store sells about 1,500 cups of coffee a day, 800 cups during the three-hour morning rush. That's nearly 20% of its business. The secret is to keep customers moving. 
So it's like a uh, production line. If somebody comes in, they want to grab a cup, they want to be able to get their coffee and then move away. We want to clear them away from the coffee so the next guest can come in, grab a cup and grab a coffee. As the customers work through the impulse zone, they pass through aisles designed to induce additional purchases. There's a lot of opportunity to impulse guests into buying something that they weren't thinking about when they came in the front door. One of the important things is putting like things together. We want to take the thinking away from guests. When people come in, and what makes a convenience store fast and efficient is that we take some of that decision making away. It's easy. I can get my coffee, I can grab a bagel, I can grab a muffin, and it's all within arm's reach. The last zone in the layout is on the periphery of the space and serves customers looking for specific merchandise. It's called the destination zone. People do come in, into convenience store for particular things in mind. And it might be something like an aspirin, a gift card, uh, a newspaper, for example. When I get my morning paper, I don't necessarily have to have this in the upfront in the most accessible place because I'm coming in specifically with this purchase in mind. That's a planned purchase. I could have that in a little further area of the store only because I'm going to go there anyway. One mainstay in the destination zone is the beverage cooler, which is deliberately placed in the back of the store. We're seeing a, a bigger trend in convenience stores where a third of our sales come from the cooler. We like to put that at the furthest point away from the door, primarily because that drives people through the store. And as these destination zone shoppers navigate the store to the checkout, they run a gauntlet of temptations. Designers also direct traffic in other ways, using tricks as simple as the placement of a door hinge to lead customers toward the impulse zone. If you think about the way a door is hinged and the body movement and the reaction of people to doors, it's important to know that uh, there's subtle little movements that could cause people to walk one way or another way. So if I'm walking down an aisle in this direction and I open my door and I, and I grab a drink and I walk away, I'm almost forced to move in the same direction in which I just came. Whereas if the door was hinged on this side, and I open the door and I grab a drink. As I close the door, I'm more likely to take my first step in the opposite direction of which I came. So there's little things like that in which we use the cooler to help move people in a different direction. The end point of the customer's three and a half minute visit is the checkout counter. People who buy with their eyes face a final enticement, the hot food service and a bevy of impulse snacks. People here who might want to buy a hot dog or, or a hot sandwich, you know, only natural that you might want to grab a bag of chips at the same time. And even as we go to the checkout counter, maybe a little candy or a little something sweet on the way out. So these are all the little cues that we're trying to do to give people an extra little moment to think about another little purchase, uh, get them enticed to, make, uh, uh, to, to pick something else up. But getting customers to make another purchase is only part of the battle in the convenience store business. Keeping stores efficient and profitable means replacing inventory quickly. Recent developments in computer technology have produced a handheld device that cuts reordering time in half while making it more accurate. We do item by item management. We have a unit that's the merchandising ordering terminal. We refer to it as the MOT. With the MOT, employees can capture store inventory data and place resupply orders immediately without waiting until the end of the day or the week. We take an inventory on what's on hand, we plug it into the unit, we make a forecast of what we think we're going to sell, and the MOT does the math and creates the order per item. The East Patchogue 7-Eleven uses the MOT to do next day ordering of its bakery, fresh food, and sandwich items. The inventory is counted following the morning rush. By 10 o'clock in the morning, our sales associate does the order for that. Um, and it's put in and it's delivered between midnight and 1 in the morning. The mod also allows convenience stores to tailor their inventory to customer preferences. The key is to stay in stock on the top sellers, which keeps the customers coming back. The store is really um, designed to fit the neighborhood and what those customers want. So it's constantly changing, constantly deleting items and bringing new items in to see if they're going to work or not. Daily deliveries of new merchandise must be squeezed in between the store's busy periods. The average convenience store's inventory includes about 5,000 individual products. There's little room on the shelves for items that don't sell quickly. There's about 1,600 square feet of selling space here. 
we don't have much back room storage. So when they deliver the cases, we get them into the floor, into the back room. When it gets too much, then we bring them out to stock the shelves also, just to keep the flow of the customers. In the East Patchogue 7-Eleven, the store layout and inventory management tools have paid off significantly. Despite being one of the smaller stores in the 7-Eleven chain, it ranks among the top in sales volume, a marvel of a three and a half minute transaction. In our rapid paced, time crunched world, convenience stores are the pit stop for people on the go. While two thirds of sales come at the gas pump, it's pick-me-up meals, snacks, and beverages that produce big profits. Five seventy-eight. But in just about every convenience store, you'll also find some longtime favorites. Classics that draw customers back again and again. This frozen concoction is known by several names, but it's best identified by its signature sound. Slurpee is 7-Eleven's name for this mixture of flavored syrup, water, and CO2 in a cup. Over six billion have been sold since 1966, with sales topping $170 million a year in the U.S. alone. But the amazing thing about this brain freeze producer is its origin. It was invented by accident during the late 50s in a small Kansas convenience store. A gentleman by the name of Omar Kinetlik had a fountain machine which broke on a hot summer day, and he put some bottles of Coca-Cola in a freezer. What came out of that freezer was a slushy carbonated drink that his customers loved. But today's Slurpee isn't the same as the original. A mid-90s change in dispenser technology ushered in a new era of the icy treat. The big innovation came when the machine was able to combine water with a special syrup that allowed the CO2 to absorb it. And that gives that creamy consistency, fluffy consistency. Making a perfect Slurpee time after time is a blend of science and technology. And it starts here at FBD, Frozen Beverage Dispensers in San Antonio, Texas. On the plant floor, dispensers are assembled one by one. Over a thousand separate parts go into making each machine considered a major advance over the previous version. The uh, evolution of electronics, of sensor technology, has allowed us to develop a whole new piece of equipment here. It's basically a chemical plant in a box. A mixing module pumps water, syrup, and CO2 into the dispenser, where they're blended together. Then, the mixture is fed into one of several 18-inch chilled aluminum barrels housed within the machine's cold chamber. The icy mixture pours from the dispenser at temperatures between 24 and 28 degrees, with the sugar and the syrup acting as an anti-freezing agent. An electronic circuit board controls the dispenser's operation. We have sensors throughout this machine that are monitoring various elements of flow, heat transfer, and those sensors then are feeding information to a very sophisticated computer program. The computer monitors the mixture inside the barrels for its ice content, while a rotating dasher stirs the product to keep it mixed. The challenge in making that perfect product is that we want a smooth, creamy texture when it comes out of here. That means the exact ice content has to be maintained. And usually that's about 60% ice. Since 1996, FBD has manufactured over 40,000 frozen drink dispensers. Today, our equipment is in uh, just about every 7-Eleven store in the United States. Frozen drinks, slurpy drinks are fun, and that's what gets people coming back. Omar Knedlik gets the credit for creating this worldwide multi-million dollar convenience store craze. But the idea for the convenience store belongs to Johnny Green of Dallas, Texas, who in 1927 ran a Southland Company ice house. These were retail stores that sold blocks of ice to customers before in-home refrigerators became widely available. Green's store was open every day, 7 in the morning to 11 at night, and like other ice houses, was also a gathering place for people looking to beat the heat during the summer. Green began offering milk, bread, and eggs to customers after local grocery stores were closed, and the convenience store concept was born. Over time, that concept spread to other Southland ice houses. 
By 1946, the company named its chain of stores 7-Eleven, referring to their hours of operation. Other convenience stores sprang up too, like Weigel's, Quick Trip, and Wawa, often in areas too small or remote to support a large supermarket. The idea was not to compete with a supermarket, but to be convenient and speedy, carrying a broad range of staples and fresh products, but not in lots of sizes. By the mid-1960s, the convenience store industry topped a billion dollars in sales for the first time. A decade later, it reached 10 billion. Today, sales total over a half trillion dollars, largely due to gasoline purchases and a steady roster of snacks that have been engineered to be fast, cheap, and good, including a convenience store favorite, beef jerky. This ready-to-eat snack is enjoyed by hikers, campers, and hunters for its high-protein, low-fat content. A popular brand is Jack Link's, available in numerous varieties. The Link family has been in the meatpacking and livestock business for generations. They started producing beef jerky in 1995 and meat snacks a few years earlier. Drying is the oldest method of preserving food. In the 1800s, beef jerky was a staple of Native Americans and pioneers who relied on it to last through the winter months when food was scarce. People today still make jerky for personal use. But large-scale production for the consumer market poses challenges. Number one key challenge to making beef jerky is making sure that it will stand up to 18 months' worth of shelf life. That calls for relentless quality control. The company's jerky starts with premium lean beef in 2,000-pound vats. On average, one vat will yield 5,000 packages of jerky. The meat is injected with various marinade mixtures for flavoring. Then it's transferred into large bins of curing solution. It'll remain there from 6 to 72 hours, depending on the flavor of the jerky. After the marination process, we'll slice the product and place it onto rods for prep to the smokehouse. Here in stainless steel lockers, they use smoke-enhanced heat to cook the strips from three to nine hours. During cooking, the meat reaches an internal temperature of 160 degrees to prevent the growth of harmful bacteria. Technicians in a nearby control room monitor the temperature inside the smokehouse. After cooking, the jerky moves to the packing machine area. Right here, you can see the product in the vibratory conveyor, and we have an inspector on the line inspecting the product before we go into the package. He's looking for any defects in the product. Following inspection, the jerky goes to a weighing machine. Then it's packed in vacuum-sealed bags. To assure the jerky will stay fresh up to 18 months, an oxygen absorption packet is inserted into each bag. If you don't have that in there, you run the risk of possibly having trapped oxygen within that bag, and then your product could potentially mold. Lastly, as a quality control measure, the jerky is sealed in the bag with a nitrogen preservative. From this point, these packages are going to travel out to be boxed into a case that will ultimately end up at the convenience store. Beef jerky's reliability as a safe, protein-rich snack has made it popular with people on the go. But its biggest fans are out of this world pioneers, America's astronauts, who take jerky along on space flights as a lightweight pick-me-up. They come for a fast cup of coffee, for a quick bite, but mainly, they come to refuel. Americans pour more than $500 billion a year into convenience store cash registers. Nearly two-thirds comes from gas purchases, sales that net less than four cents per gallon in profit. It's led convenience stores to try tapping into the customer's wallet another way. We're seeing a really big increase in food service. More and more people are coming to convenience stores to eat. It's uh, going to continue to be more about feeding people. Now we have a brand new hot food program, which is just fantastic. It allows customers to come in, uh, pick up lunch, dinner. They could always have breakfast here. Um, have a pizza in 90 seconds, hot and out the door. Uh, chicken tenders, an assortment of chicken wings. The battle for the eating out dollar is heating up. And the machine that helped bring this about? 
a countertop rapid cook oven called a Turbo Chef. The Turbo Chef cooks food up to 12 times faster than a conventional oven. In the convenience store, that speed translates into sales. What it does for the uh, convenience store operator is it enables them to serve foods that they normally wouldn't get in a quick service uh, manner. Pizzas, wings, sandwiches, all cooked to order in less than about uh, you know three minutes. The Turbo Chef manufacturing plant is located near Dallas, Texas, where they produce nine types of ovens for a range of rapid cooking platforms. The patented technology behind them combines a hairdryer type heat source with a conventional microwave oven. Microwave ovens use radio frequency energy to vibrate the water molecules inside food in order to heat it. But the ovens don't provide consistent quality for the commercial food service industry. The Turbo Chef oven uses high velocity, high temperature heat to cook the surface of the food, while the microwaves cook the inside. The heat is circulated evenly throughout the chamber through jets above and below the food. The original concept was developed in the mid 90s for the fast food pizza market. But cooking 10 times faster brought a problem. The oven would produce 10 times the amount of grease, smoke, and odor. The solution came from a surprising place, a car's exhaust system. This catalytic filtration is very much the same as what's found in every automobile in, in the world today. Basically, in our oven, as the air impacts the food, and picks up the odor, the smoke, and the grease that's been generated from the food item, it passes through the, uh, the body of the catalytic converter, and that's then converted into CO2 and water. And then that clean air is then recirculated through the oven. The catalytic filters solved Turbo Chef's cooking problem. But the commercial food service industry was slow to accept rapid cook ovens. Then in 2003, the Subway chain adopted the Turbo Chef oven for its hot toasted sandwiches. From 1993 to about 2003, we probably developed and sold close to uh, 3,000 ovens. In 2004, we uh, rolled out about 19,000 ovens to Subway for their new toasting initiative. It didn't take long for convenience stores to jump on the rapid cook bandwagon. With whole pizzas ready in 90 seconds and toasted sandwiches in less than half a minute, Turbo Chef has become a fixture on convenience store counters nationwide. We are in a lot of the, uh, the major uh, convenience stores, a lot of the, uh, the major uh, chains. We have about 90,000 uh, ovens installed worldwide in, uh, in about 93 countries. The rapid cook oven is changing the kinds of foods convenience stores offer their customers. Yes. But technology is also speeding up the ordering process. Case in point, Wawa convenience stores have placed computer terminals at their deli counters. Have a go, buddy. For a chain that makes 70 million sandwiches a year, this means faster sandwiches with fewer mistakes. That's a main menu. It's a simple touch screen. You can pick them from a menu of choices of snacks, beverages, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And if we pick a lunch category, you can pick from many different selections for sandwiches, whether it be a toasted hoagie or a cold hoagie or a simple sandwich. But what's the customer's reaction? It's better than saying, hey, I want pepperoni on a toasted bologna sandwich with anything, just you're built to order. In this case, you're a lot faster. Actually, I try, I try to time myself. Fastest I ever got was three and a half seconds. Time to see just how fast ordering a sandwich can be. So, OK, so I hit my lunch menu, because that's where I get most of my wild hoagies at lunch. Then I hit the cold hoagie. Once I hit cold hoagie, that's when it all begins. All right, ready? One, two, three, go. And that is my Wawa wah hoagie. In the convenience store's ongoing quest to maintain customers, saving time by shaving seconds off any process is critical. But buying gas or a hot meal aren't the only reasons people stop at convenience stores. For some, it's about trying your luck. Well, we come for the lottery. <laughs> Everybody wants to win. I just come for the lottery, that's it. You never know if you're going to be the next lucky winner. And you can't win without a ticket. The urge to get rich quick has made winners of convenience stores. At least $30 billion is spent on lottery tickets in stores nationwide each year. But there's one place that's the jackpot capital of America. It's not Vegas or Atlantic City. It's here, Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. 
the town that sells the most winning lottery tickets in the U.S. Winners worth over $500 million have been purchased at five stores along a stretch of road running through town called the Miracle Mile. And the luckiest place in America's luckiest town? Ma and Pa's convenience store, open 17 hours a day, seven days a week. A store where three lottery machines work nonstop from open to close. This store sells about a million and a half tickets a year. On a normal basis, it's probably every minute that we're selling somebody a ticket. There are usually about 30 games going on at a time, from small scratch-off cards to the big multi-state lottery, like Powerball. The bigger the prize, the busier Ma and Pa's gets. It's crazy when the lottery jackpot gets big. Our record of selling tickets in one day was 95,000 tickets. That's over 6,000 tickets an hour, nearly two every second. When the jackpot is really big, the place is packed. I mean, people will be outside the doors, people have to park blocks away, and they just, they come in, and the place, it's just, it's a zoo. Ma and Paz has sold over $237 million in winning lottery tickets since 1994. Eight people have won 100,000 or more. Four have topped a million. The biggest prize went to 100 local cheese factory workers who shared a winning ticket worth over $208 million in 2006. It's made the store a gathering place for players sharing one conviction. It's a lucky place. Luck gravitates here. I'm hoping it'll be lucky again. Thank you. you is this the winning you. number? You bet it is. With so many winning tickets sold, is there a secret to lottery success? The statistics say that 65% of lottery winners are from quick picks let the computer pick. The other 35% are from people that choose their own numbers. So I guess the computer is the one that is lucky. I'm realistic about my chance of winning here, so we're pretty much just messing around. I haven't won yet, <laughs> but I still keep on trying. Ma and Paz has become the convenience store mecca for players armed with hope, a dollar, and a dream of adding their name to the store's list of winners. There are more than 144,000 convenience stores in the United States, most open 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. These high-volume, high-speed dynamos generate tremendous cash flow. But having all that cash on hand has a downside. It makes them targets. While annually, 80% of all convenience stores remain crime-free, across the nation, 60 stores are robbed each day. That makes security a critical concern for store owners and operators. Stopping robberies begins with the store's design. We want people to see inside, and so, you know, having a lot of windows is really important. Hutch's convenience store in Elk City, Oklahoma, is a regional bus stop, handling up to 10 buses a day. To keep the store safe, open windows are a part of its security strategy. We put glass, as much glass as we can, so that everybody can see in and see out. We want everybody to be aware of what's going on. Anywhere in the store, you want to keep a line of sights open. Another way to improve security, putting the checkout counter near the front of the store, in full view of the outside. But there's a high-tech level of protection, too, that takes a page from the world of spies. Companies like West Tech Intelligence Surveillance provide interactive store monitoring, streamed via the internet to a remote command center. It's a technological advance over having an armed guard on site. Really what you do with a guard is you project a sense of, well, this is probably not a safe place because they have a guard here. Right? Why is there a guy walking around with a gun on his hip? This is probably not a place I want to do business. Hunch's convenience store employs an interactive system of high-resolution cameras, monitors, microphones, and speakers to provide full store security coverage. With the cameras that we have in place here, with the presentation view monitor here, you can announce your presence very subtly that says, we're watching. Watching and ready to activate the system at the first sign of trouble. All it takes is a push of a button to send a silent signal off-site. And that lands in a series of servers at our command center, and we take that signal that tells us exactly what's going on. Everything cold and secured? They can determine how serious it is, how quick the police need to respond, and they can also tell the individual that they need to leave the premises immediately. This is West Tech Interactive. Begin directly to the individual in the red vest. 
who is in the drive-thru of this location. Leave this property now or police will be dispatched. Digital technology also allows convenience store managers and owners to keep in touch with other stores from a personal computer or mobile device. That's an advantage for Chris Stevens, who runs the East Patchogue 7-Eleven on Long Island, New York, as well as several other stores. I'm in constant communication with all my stores 24-7. I'm also in visual contact with them by using uh, my iPad and tapping into my security systems in all the stores. Through its layout and high-tech surveillance tools, a convenience store can send a clear message. For well, someone that's looking to rob a facility, they want to be able to come in undetected and get in and out as quick as possible. And what we're trying to do is show them that that's not possible in our facility. One key way to reduce the threat of robbery is at the checkout register. Our staff are trained to keep very, very little amount of cash in the drawer. We have a safe system that allows them to drop the cash as soon as they take it in. This way they main a minimal amount of cash in the drawer. Today's safe is the cornerstone of a store's cash management system. No longer a metal-clad box hidden away in a back room, it's a mini fortress designed to deter robbery and also speed transactions at the checkout. It's also smart enough to instantly detect counterfeit bills. Our safe we have in place here has two bill validators. The safe will read the denomination and the amount, so we always know exactly how much they inserted into the safe. That way, they can keep the amount of money in their drawer at a very minimum. No question, the new generation of convenience store safes is a defense against robbery. But just how secure is it? Well, this safe is over 1,000 pounds. It is, it is bolted into the floor. This uh, would be virtually impossible to take out. If safes like these can't be taken out, can a determined criminal break into it? Dunbar Armored manufactures a 250-pound solid steel electronic safe, the CN2400, built for the convenience store industry. The company agreed to a test of its strength and durability at a firing range. Dunbar even supplied two safe crackers for the job. Uh, we brought out various tools that, that uh, criminals might use to try to break into our safe, a drill, a crowbar, a sledgehammer, and a two-headed axe. I'm going to try to drill out the lock to get to the money compartment. It's just made a little hole, not but a quarter of an inch deep. It's not getting anywhere near the mechanism. Next, Steve tries a crowbar. And of course, because the door is tightly fitted, there's no way to get in. Now it's Mike's turn, using a nine pound sledgehammer. I've been beating on this thing here for a little bit, and the uh, worst I've done is knocked off a little bit of paint and messed up the sticker. The other thing I can try is maybe to cut off the hinges with an ax. Mike's ax assault lasts for 10 minutes. The progress so far? It's still intact. I guess the next thing we can try to do is shoot the, the safe. But not with just some small caliber pistol. This is an AK-47, probably not what a robber of a convenience store would use, but we just want to show the toughness of the safe. Time to check the results. Well, we uh, still don't seem to have been very effective in doing anything other than some more cosmetic damage and just knocking off the handle. It's uh, something that can easily be replaced. We've tried to pry it open with a crowbar. We've tried to drill through the lock. We've hit it with a sledgehammer. We've hit it with a two-sided ax. And now we've shot it with a AK-47 and the safe is still intact, and the money's safe. There's no way for a criminal to get into this safe. Unless, of course, 
you have the combination and a key. For nearly a century, convenience stores have been walk-in brick-and-mortar buildings, stocked with goods and staffed by clerks and cashiers. And it's grown into a huge industry nationwide. There's 145,000 stores. They process 58 billion transactions every year. Thank you. One in every $23 is spent in a convenience store. But a company in Memphis, Tennessee, is changing the look of the convenience store and the entire shopping experience. Smart Mart offers the ultimate inconvenience. drive through shopping. Customers begin at one of four shopping ports. They use a touchscreen to place their order. On-screen icons appear, corresponding to aisles in a store. They select products from that aisle to fill their shopping cart. After making their selections, customers pay for the items with cash, credit, or debit card. Then comes some robotic wizardry featuring computers, motors, and conveyor belts. Inside the 53 by 8 and a half foot building, a computer signals mechanized dispensers to release the products. As the products are dispensed, they're dropped onto a central conveyor belt that runs in either direction from the front of the store to the back. At the end of the conveyor belt, the products are transferred to diverter conveyors that move items from one side of the building to the other into one of the four different order ports. The Smart Mart system can handle a variety of product types and sizes, from a small pack of razor blades to a gallon of milk or 12 packs of beverages. The system also checks IDs for alcohol purchases. Customers place their driver's license in a slot. A digital camera transmits the photo to an off-site call center, and there it's compared to the customer in the car. Excellent. Connecting the motors, conveyor belts, and dispensers together are about 60 miles of wires and cables, about the same quantity found in a modern passenger jet. The store's delivery system has also been engineered to prevent a common shopping nuisance. You don't want your potato chips to come out and then have a 12-pack uh, from soft drinks drop on top of it. So we've assigned a fragility factor to each product. We dispense the ones that are stronger or more rugged first or that might tend to crush the others. So your soft drinks, your gallon of milk come out before your bread and your eggs would come out. Smart Mart's technology is impressive, but it's not the first time automation has been introduced into retail shopping. That distinction goes to Clarence Saunders, who founded the first self-service grocery store, Piggly Wiggly, in 1916. In 1937, Saunders opened the fully automated grocery store, also in Memphis, called Key Doozle. Shoppers viewed the merchandise displayed in glass cabinets. They made their selections by inserting a special key into a labeled keyhole. That produced a perforation punched onto a ticker tape. The tape would be read by a machine at the cashier's desk which sent electric signals by wires to the back room, where the items would slide down conveyor belts to be bagged. But as innovative as Key Doozle was, Saunders' concept failed. The existing technology could not meet the demand. Circuits overloaded. The conveyor belts couldn't keep up with the volume of purchases at peak times, and too often, shoppers got the wrong merchandise. The three Key Doozle stores Saunders opened in Memphis closed by 1950 and his idea for a fully automated store went into mothballs until Smart Mart. Today, technology is in sync with the automated concept. Smart Mart is a store engineered to get you quickly back on the road. But there's one convenience store in the Midwest where speed isn't the main attraction. Arcadia, Oklahoma is a small town of 300 people located along the mother road of America, Route 66. For decades, motorists zoomed by Arcadia on their way west. Now, they have a reason to stop. I like it because of the pop bottle and all the sodas. The coolest roadside landmark in America, a pop bottle with a straw towering 66 feet high over Route 66. That's awesome. It's pretty big. Yeah. It's amazing. 
The store is called, appropriately enough, Pops. And since opening in 2007, it's become one of the most popular sites in Oklahoma. Inside, along with offering travelers food and fuel, Pops adds fizz. You'll find over 600 different flavors of soda from the U.S. and 17 countries around the world. I like the um, uh, Purple Crush. I got some random flavors. She got some squirt. Swamp juice. Yeah. <laughs> Most of the sodas here, especially the stranger ones, the weird ones, they, they move well. Uh, people love them. Uh, we've got everything from cucumber sodas to celery sodas to sodas made with jalapeno oil, sodas made with dill weed, uh, juniper berries, spruce beer, and then, of course, just a wide array of the various root beers, oranges, grapes, and, you know, a lot of the more standard flavors, mango, banana, you name it, it's out there. Want to check on you, make sure you're all right. Good, 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 thank you. With a restaurant and a retail store selling a variety of souvenirs, Pops is blurring the definition of a convenience store. What is Pops? Is it a gas station? Is it a convenience store? Is it a restaurant? Is it a landmark? This is not just a stop, it's an experience. An experience that for most customers lasts longer than a three and a half minute pit stop. This is her birthday. She decided to do her birthday here. We're kind of celebrating our 25th anniversary, <laughs> and they're getting married soon, so thought we'd come and have some fun. Pops is a convenience store that's about more than speed. We've become the place where people gather in this area. That's actually where the idea of the first convenience store began, in a Dallas, Texas ice house in 1927. It not only provided customers goods like milk and bread, it provided a sense of community. So while most convenience stores today are quick stops built for speed and efficiency, there are still places, like Pops, where people go not to buy time, but to spend it with each other. <laughs>